So welcome to episode four uh, from the Effectively uh, mini podcast series. And I have with me today, Ria Bach, a colleague of mine from Greater Than and a very long-term practitioner of collective presencing, art posting, trauma-informed collaboration, therapies and coach. Uh, welcome, Ria. Thank you for being with me here today. Is Thanks there anything that, inviting. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to, to add about your background before we get started? No, it's, it's mainly a, a move over the many years from being a therapist to coaching teams and coaching systems, you could say. So that's maybe connects the dots a tiny bit. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, exactly. We has loads of experience with um, self-organizing. So I'm also very curious to see what's... Um, yeah, your unique approach from the therapeutical and coach perspective uh, can can bring in in this in this mix of self organizing or intersection of self organizing yeah. and emotions. What role they play? How how do we see them at play? Um, the reason I ask you uh, to do this podcast with me was that I wanted to have um, a podcast that was as specific as possible, and but then we can see where we go. We can go as abstract as. The conversation needs um, mm -hmm. but yeah my ask for you was about the circle practice mm -hmm. because in episode one Ellen and I and I don't know if that's a part of the recording or not but we were having a bit of a conversation what are the things that a group could start trying out so at great uh -huh. we do loads of different things and uh, there are I think there are also many structures that are building upon let's say this emotional capacity uh, that, that some people have and bring to the group. Um, but then we think, well, there are practices and structures that might not be adequate for all groups, might not be safe. For example, like a happy money story in which we split money, the goal feeling uh -huh. that everyone is happy. And it's like, well, but you're doing this with money. So it causes a lot of triggers. And, yep. <laughs> and there's a lot of, symbolic that we project onto money so it might not be the safest thing for a team to start, to start. with exactly and yeah, I thought yeah, yeah. my hypothesis was that circle practice might be a, a good option I will ask yeah, you as yeah. well yes yeah okay so maybe so, let first ex explain let's say the basics of circle pra practice and and um why that would be good to start with. Um, actually, what you try to do with circle practice is to give everyone a voice without going into any discussion or debate. Because the circle practice is, as it say, normally you sit in circle, normally not around tables. <laughs> and very specific is that you work with a talking piece, some object, um, and if you do it online, you can just mute and unmute, uh, but some object that makes visible who is speaking and all the others are listening. And the basic thing is like, there's no interruption. And that's in the beginning for when you have like a, a debate, culture that's very hard for some people not to interrupt or not to defend or not blah 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 yeah so um what you need for circle practice is people who know the practice like and there's tons of resources online like um the circle way is the practice or one of the lineages you could say uh, and they have many, many resources on their website. Um, there's other lineages like, what is the, the way of counsel? Uh, it's another lineage. Um, so you need first people who know about circle practice to be what we call the hosts. 
So they can explain the principle, they can explain what I just said about the talking piece, and they will introduce like some of like, you listen with attention and you speak with intention. Yeah, so every circle practice is also um, with a question in the middle. And that's another, you could say, job of, of, the, of the hosts or the facilitators is to actually come up with a question that is not like, what are we going to do with this and this? But, but like, is there a question that's like underneath the topic, the issue at hand, like that can break open some assumptions? And then that is a, a question that everyone in the circle can relate to. And it's not a question that's like how it would sit like in the director's head, but how can we translate it in a way that everyone who is in the circle can actually feels invited to, to speak about that question. And so with that framing and saying talking piece and the intention and attention and all that, then the point is that everyone has a time to speak. And normally you give the talking piece from one to the other in, in the circle. And if you're not ready to speak, you can just say, I pass. And then the, the talking piece comes back to you until, until everyone has spoken. Um, so what is, why is that important? Because one of the things you could add in the framing is like, listen to the whole. It's not, I'm not listening only to you or I'm not listening to your colleague. I'm listening to the 10, 15 voices in the room, actually. And that's like the whole you have to work with or that, that, that yeah, is present. And um, so it's it's a training, actually. <laughs> yeah, I see it as a training to be in circle, to actually listen and listen and listen. Because if you're one of the 15, you have to listen to 14 people. And you will notice that the, how would I say, the conversation deepens can go to a deeper level because you're not interrupted you're not there's no fight going on because everything can be what i call can be in the middle everything can be dropped into the middle uh whatever emotions or triggers that come up or why something is important or not or um so it's actually a training in in listening and deeper understanding of where people are coming from. Um, and a very, very simple practice to start with is like a check-in. Like, okay, we arrive, check-in, like, where are you coming from? Like, let's say um, your mom was rushed to the hospital yesterday. If you can speak that, then the 14 others kind of know like, oh, Wow, yeah, she must be stressed. Now I understand why she was like eh, this morning. Or yeah. So it gives some understanding and check-ins can be can be fun or it can be all kinds of things. But that's like everybody has a voice and everybody can add something, even if you do it one minute each or one sentence or even one word, or you can do it in the chat of the or but just like everyone has a voice, yeah? That, I think that's the, the core of circle practice. Do we have a time limitation per person? Uh, sometimes we have because that's the nature of our culture and meeting culture. Um, but if, if you have a really serious 
question, topic, issue in the middle, um, it's really important to take enough time and to say like, okay, and you can say we have like 30 minutes for 10 people. Everybody kind of knows what that means. But in, in let's say, in, in official circle practice, you would have a guardian as one of the roles who would say like, hey, we are halfway the people, but we are somewhere there in, in the time frame. Let's take all responsibility or that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the principles of um, circle practice. And I was wondering, I have one in mind and I'm not sure if it's a common one or it's more maybe for something more specific. And it was this one about uh, speak from the eye uh, principle, uh, because I have to say, sometimes I'm in some um, circle practices, usually it's quite magical, but sometimes like someone starts intellectualizing about what's going on in, in the room. Do we mm. have that as a principle um, or also how, um, yeah, how do we trans, because I think that's the easy variant when we start intellectualizing instead of <laughs> opening up. But yeah, is it a principle? And then how do we travel from that? What is our, could be our journey to say, okay, no, I speak from, from the eye actually. It's not always that easy, depending on how you're doing and depending on yeah, the topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, when you're the host of the circle, and most of the time, you know your people. Uh, and that could be a translation of speak with intention. Like the intention, speak with intention is like, be aware of what you say, how you say it, that it has impact on the others, yeah? And so it could be that some people start, yeah, but they and blah, 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 like like judging people or um, so that's the invitation to actually indeed speak from what you feel or what you bring without judging others and and sometimes an invitation to speak indeed from the eye and not in general concepts or and but it's it's part of our let's say working culture so that will take some practice that's why it's called circle practice um to actually yeah open up deepen a bit uh, and come from the head also to the heart and what is happening in your body and that could be a specific invitation at some point uh, that can be made by the facilitators um, yeah yeah so we have let's say i'll try to repeat the basics so yeah, we yeah. sit in circle um online or uh in yeah. person ideally uh we work with a talking piece or muting and muting ourselves uh when we're online then uh, we could say your principle is that uh, there are no interruptions. We just listen one by one according to where the talking, who's holding uh, the talking yeah. piece. A principle would be listen with attention and speak with intention. Yeah. And then knowing your people, you can adapt that um, to what is needed. Yeah, you can translate it actually. Yeah. 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 And then we have a question in the middle as well. That's another requirement to have a circle practice. And then we have a host and a guardian those yeah would be and maybe yes. a bit more about um <clears throat> the guardian sometimes has um like something that makes a noise like a gong or something <clears throat> sorry because sometimes you feel like a sharing of 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 somebody is like has some weight or has some deep emotion or something and so in when you start the guard when you start circle practice let's say in your team it would be good to have officially named somebody as guardian who actually listens to that rhythm and also like when you do long circles like one hour or so or even longer 
especially when you're in bigger groups. The guardian also keeps an eye on, hey, are we getting tired? Do we need a little break or something like three minutes? And so the gong uh, or whatever noise you make uh, is like saying, okay, now is silence. Everybody can breathe. Everybody can relax again. Maybe something was shared that was very emotional or whatever. Um, and then ringing the gong again, and then the circle continues. So that's that's the roles of the guardian. Uh, if you're used to circle practice, if everybody is used to circle practice, uh, like what we do uh, these days in collective presencing, anyone can ask for for silence. So it would announce like, I would like a minute of silence or two minutes or whatever. So everybody does that. Like they are holding the talking piece, although they are not talking. Yeah, they are asking for silence and then they say, okay, thank you. And they can say something or maybe not and just put the talking piece back and then it can travel again. So. Yeah, thank you for adding that. I realize I haven't asked you about size and you've been mentioning size of groups. Is there a limit to how big or how small the group can be? Um, I mean, you can do circle practice with two people, no problem. Uh, uh, you can even try with your relationship or with your children or whatever. Um, and then maybe there's more of the general question, like how is everybody doing these days? Yeah, could be. Um, size, we have had circles of like 40, 50 people, but then of course that takes like two hours or three hours or yeah, I've, I have a, a very famous, famous in, in our context um, of a circle that was with people working in the European institutions. And as a start of a three-day process, um, we asked the question of what in their history made them decide to work for the European institutions because they come from all over of Europe. So we started in the morning and it went till halfway afternoon because there were so many stories of war and refugees and forced whatever. It was pretty amazing. Um, and we had to adapt the whole, the whole program. And we did because it was such a deep understanding of the deeper passion that was behind everyone. It was not just, oh, give me a job in Brussels and that pays well. That was not the case at all. They all had like deep, deep personal family stories that related to that and how they want to contribute to the peace project actually, yeah. So. Yeah, I was wondering uh, for when is a circle practice adequate? Um, what type of situations? Is it something we could do to say our group of people when we want to deepen our relationships, um, our practice? So we do it every week or every two weeks, just with some regularity. Does it make sense? Um, or yeah, what what are the situations where you would say ah, th those are the ones in which you need a circle practice? And at the same time, I wanted to say maybe not to wait. Maybe that's something we do, uh, not to wait for attention to bubble up to start doing circle practices um but yeah no how, because the... that's the most difficult of course um other situations i think it's more motivation than situations for me the motivation is having every voice heard and the motivation is getting away from the i call it fight the debate, discussion, the fighting culture of who wins or which arguments wins or da-da-da-da-da, and to actually 
read the whole system. Like if there are 15 people in the team, oh, that's that's a landscape we're working with. So it's it's more for me, it's a point of motivation. Do you want to change your culture from let's say the fighting and the dominance over to something that's more collaborative, more equal, more peer-to-peer. And then you actually train everybody by doing that. You train everybody to actually build a deeper listening capacity as you listen to the nine or 10 others and train actually your own sharing capacity of what you understand your own deeper motivations and how you can share them not with over i would say high charged emotions but just naming what's what's in you what's present what's what the topic the issue brings up in you uh without the fight without uh, I retreat without all that, but just this is what's happening for me. Uh, so indeed, I would not wait until there's a conflict. Um, and if that's the case, I would advise you to have some support from outside your team because uh, otherwise it would be way too difficult. Yeah, we just had, uh, you know, we have these uh, rhythm members calls at Greater Than. So every two weeks uh, we get together and Elena came up with this model of having a few doing calls. So we work with things or talk about things that we need to talk mm-hmm. about. And then the last one was a being call. And then Melinda proposed uh, a circle practice. And yeah, there was something very, um, yeah, I found it quite magical always that you know we come in with a few tensions or triggers and then it's like you listen to everyone and there's something that is like ah it goes it relaxes um somehow and we're all like ah you know we should do this more often like what don't we do that um and I for example I realized that for me one of the biggest challenges of this sort of things is that well you know when do you find the time and it's like well when do you make the time uh for uh for these two yeah, it's, 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 how would I say? It's one of these more feminine things, like the being, the sharing, um, that people still don't see the value that if you do that more, the whole atmosphere changes, just as what you said, like, yeah. <laughs> Because you understand where other people are coming from and you, there's no need to come to a conclusion in a circle. It's more like we read the landscape of where our team is and or where we stand regarding a certain question or topic. And sometimes it's that's actually enough to actually know what what happens next or uh it's it's amazing it's one of these stories of of one of these african tribes where people sit under the tree you know in 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 the kind of desert like landscape and they sit under the tree and they talk everybody has can talk everybody can talk and there's no formal decision but Because everybody heard everyone, they know what to do. That's one of these archetypal stories, I I don't know. And like people from the West, like saying like, but what was decided? Yeah, there was no formal decision taken, but somehow because people see the whole thing, they know, okay, I know what to do, so. It's a different wow. way of working. Yeah, that's pretty impressive <laughs> that without a formal decision-making process, yeah, people get to know what to do. Well, that's the power 
of the well format and culture I guess yeah it's things. yeah that's why I say it's it's the motivation is do you want to change your culture your working culture basically and then you can take indeed the muscles you have gained into the more difficult topics like okay we have a pot of money from this project how do we divide it between the ones who were involved uh, or other kind of things yeah and yeah I would like to go back to my hypothesis that circle practice might be the one thing that almost or many teams all teams or uh, many teams could try do you think it's something we really could try to apply let's say yeah my question would be what are the minimal conditions and in what type of structural and cultural um, context can we do a circle practice do you think i mean you can actually do it anywhere um the thing is do you have somebody who can facilitate host it or two or three people uh if you're a bigger circle and and the, the, the decision the motivation to do it like i know a guy in australia um who works in a typical startup, whatever, uh, something with online and coding and all that. Um, and he started, I think they call it wisdom council or, or something or something. They do on Friday afternoon. So out of all the operational and they just share what they see, what they sense about internal, external, how the business is with, within a bigger context. But there's no decisions. There's no operational. It's just sharing the sensing. And it, it seems to be valuable. Yeah. I mean, there's... Probably everyone has sometimes like, yeah, what about this? Uh, that never comes to the formal agenda of a typical team meeting, but somehow it's 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 hanging in the air or or tensions that need some attention before <laughs> it becomes into a conflict or um yeah, it it can happen anywhere when you have people who can hold it and when there's motivation to do it yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, i'm very curious about um something i discussed uh with tomomi in the previous episode and by the way i realized we're in episode five and not four if i don't <laughs> self-correct myself again um but I was asking her, and again, I don't know if it was in previous post or during the episode discussion, the bar that was recorded, but um, it was about doing this sort of practices in traditional hierarchical organizations. And I was asking, you know, is it safe um, to do this in, I don't know, have you had good experiences with that? Or there is a sort of, let's say also condition that needs to be had by I don't know, the leader of that department or organization for it. So my concern would be, ah, you know, we share things in the, if you really speak from your own, let's say source of truth, if you speak from the eye, there might be things that you share that you might be afraid of the consequences that, um, that might have. Mm. Um, how do we deal with that? Or what is the precondition that we need for us to feel safe? And I'm saying hierarchical because, well, we're in power over. So, well, you know, if you, you have a boss and makes a decision because of something that you might have implied or said and is not aligned to whatever. Hopefully not. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I'm curious about this. Um, I don't have examples of that. Uh, but I do have examples of, let's say, participatory processes in, in, in units of, let's say, 100 people or something. And then you have a two day, very exciting participatory process and people come up with lots of ideas and then they never get implemented. And then, then you get like 
a lot of cynicism. People say like, okay, why did I speak up? Why did I come up with this idea? Because it leads to nowhere. Um, so yeah, I would, um, if let's say you want to try this in a team, um, and your team leader or whatever it's called is not in favor of it, that will be difficult. Because you want to change a culture in the end, yeah? Um, and if, if, if the hierarchy doesn't, doesn't go with it, then it's, I would say it's not safe enough. Um, but I have, I have a few stories of people who who said like, can I have the the mandate to host the team meeting five teams in a different way? Like that was somewhere in also in European institutions, like people who learn about circle practice and all these participatory methods and then team meetings, let's say 20 people or something. 15 they happen in the very classical classical way and and she got so fed up with it and she said can we have an experiment and can we try can i have the mandate to facilitate the next three or the next five in a different way and then we look back if it's better or not and what we can take from it or not i mean in that way you 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 make a space what is some experiment um yeah that's that's what i would answer to your question yeah cool so this means if you know we have the mandate or let's say the hierarchy is in favor and they want to practice the change then it's also something that we could try out and apply yeah. in these sorts of organizations yeah yeah i'm i'm these days i'm saying everywhere we are experimenting. I mean, like what we do in Greater Than with the happy money story and with all that, we are experimenting all the time because we don't know or we haven't learned or it hasn't existed an organization run on a peer-to-peer -peer basis or more humane or more self-organized or whatever label you give it we are just experimenting and it's always good to whenever you start with even a check-in or a circle practice like give the team like a 10-minute debrief like how was this what 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 did we learn what what was good what could we make better all that yeah, so to do that also in a way of a learning process for us to totally. evolve our culture. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And not saying like this is now the new way and the better way. For some piece, some points it does, and for some points maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm I would like to make now a bit of a more explicit link between the circle practice emotionality and self-organizing. Okay. Um, for me, circle practice is a very emotional, um, even if sometimes I'm not, um, I know, like I don't have attention with the question or anything, but it's this listening of, okay, what's happening with me? Like what's coming up or what is what other people are saying, what does with me? So there's a lot of um, resonances. So there's a lot to work. Um, from from what comes yeah. from the others that's on the one hand and then also on the other hand how when you express yourself yeah how do you do that and what that what does uh, with you like sometimes I start very nervous and I relax as I speak and thoughts become clearer sometimes it's the other way around and sometimes it's after you've spoken I don't know sometimes this sort of electricity uh, in your body and then there's also so that's let's say my experience might be many different experiences uh, so there are many things that happen at the like individual level or as a resonance with others but then there's also the atmosphere that we have 
collectively before the circle and after the circle and you can feel that something has changed um but yeah i would be curious to know like how do you see emotionality playing a role in circle practice um from your experience apart from what i said um and and i'm curious about something you mentioned at the beginning about uh maybe you know when i express myself i don't do it with a big emotional charge so what is the I don't know if, if there is one, what is the sweet spot of tuning into the emotionality, but maybe like not full on so that we are aware of the impact yeah. that we're having. I guess, well, that would be my, my guess that that's why we try to be aware of it. But yeah, I would like to hear a bit from you. Anything that you can think of emotionality and uh, circle practice. And self-organization. And self-organization. Yeah. Um. Yeah, let me start here. Um, I've heard, and still people say it, uh, it's like, oh, let's bring our whole selves to, to the job, to the workplace, yeah? And um, I want to make a comment on that because I've seen teams let's say, explode or have very difficult times um, because people start, uh, how would I say, start seeing the work team as, as the family. And that's not what it is. Huh? I would say a work space is based on contracts. You can step in, you can step out from both sides of the contract. Yeah. A family, you cannot step out. I mean, your mom stays your mom and your sister is your sister forever. Yeah, that's you cannot step out. So, of course, when we introduce circle practice or this new culture, which I would call as a more humane culture, yeah, uh, like you can be said when your mom was rushed to the hospital yesterday, or you can be upset or you don't have to hide that. That it doesn't mean that all your emotional topics that you have will be solved by the team. Yeah. So, and a lot of belonging issues I see happening or like, Oh, you need, because you started this initiative, you should uh, provide me with contracts. Or you, there's, there's lots of dynamics that you bring from your education, from your upbringing into the working context. And that might be difficult and we, we need to be, become, become aware of it. Um, So what I stress in circle practice is like the middle of the circle. Like even if I tension with you, like there's something you said yesterday, blah, 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 blah. If, if, I, if we are in circle practice, I can name what I feel or what I felt and put it in the middle instead of pointing it to you, yeah? That makes for a wider context than just you and me. Yeah, it's it's widening the space, and you can drop whatever you felt, whatever you were thinking, also in the middle. And so that's what I mean with training that muscle, like getting out of the of the fight, even if the fights are not big fights, but like. <laughs> This person, huh? that person, huh? but becoming more humane and also being held by the whole circle. It's not just you and me. Yeah. Everybody can hold, everybody can witness you, everybody can listen to both of us. So that makes for a wider space. And um, 
it be, it's it's a learning it's a learning process it's an, a maturing process to be able to name your triggers to name your emotions without blaming the other without judging the other but just like yeah that's what it did to me that's how i felt and most of the time there's something like and i could relate that because my mom always did the same or my sister or my <laughs> whatever um so we learn if you take it on over a longer time frame you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about others um but this that's what you learn by listening because talk the talking piece is like sacred like that's one of the early mistakes you can make even as a facilitator it's like thinking like oh this is too much or and you intervene and so you break the rule of we listen when we don't have the talking piece um so yeah now i lost my thread but yeah what do you learn is holding more intensity that's what we all learn instead of lashing it out or speaking behind the back or retreating into a corner we learn to hold more intensity each of us and as 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 a organism as as a team uh, and i think i think we need that for whatever is going on and whatever is to come in the world yeah Oh, I have lots of questions there. Uh, yeah, I find that extremely interesting. It's something that still intrigues me because I experience it, but I cannot explain it. This thing of speaking to the middle, it's a complete different energy that if I say something yeah. to you, and then there's also something I find in sharing, well, in the circle practice, as we'd call it here, um, uh, about being witnessed, that if I am witnessed, I am able to hold myself better for whatever the reason it's like I want to and, and not because but I've been thinking a lot about that sometimes I thought mm -hmm. that ah, you know you just want other people to see you in a in a better light but in a way it's like I don't know having the others for me it, it does call this best or better version of myself that maybe I'm not able to hold if mm. I am you know just with myself or talking to my partner because then I just you know rant but then it's like, okay, but, you know, what does it do? And there's also something, I think it has to do for me with the connection that then I yeah. feel like, oh, why we're, why are we here together? Or what what is it that we're trying to achieve together as a group? And then, I don't know if it's the compassion, but yeah, there's something about being witnessed. That has the witnessing a crazy is... Crazy energy. It's so important and, and it's so simple actually and it has a strong it, it's strong in a way um yeah if we if everybody can think back like oh if i was just witnessed by my parents like just the way i was with no judgment if i was sad or if i was angry or if i was bored or whatever if it's it's something that um we we don't realize in our culture as we run around <laughs> so much and but i'm i'm also a therapist so what do you do actually in the therapy session you witness the client basically i mean you ask questions so that things come out but then you witness them yeah and that's it's actually saying you're okay you're all right with the sadness, with the anger, with the hate, with the deep whatever, with the joy, with the creativity. You're, you're fine. You're all right. You can be here in, as you are. And that's, that's what witnessing does. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a simple but powerful practice or part of circle practice is that you indeed these other people are all listening when you're speaking 
Yeah. And they're even silent when you looking for words or you have a tear in your eye or and they just hold the space and they witness you. It's it's very simple and very powerful. Yeah. And I just wanted to drop because this witnessing thing, like it didn't become clear to me till I think um late at the end of this summer, I had a, a bit of a tricky collaboration mm -hmm. and I didn't have at the brief moment. So I had like one one. So it's like I could let's say talk about the topic itself, but we didn't have like a hosting team kind of debrief where I could be witness with the things that hadn't worked for me. And it was like about how I felt. Mm. And that was so strong. And the lack of that is like somehow it's the like unhealed um, uh -huh. somewhere because it felt like, oh, exactly. And the, I, I didn't understand what it was. Is this, ah, because even if I know that's not the case, but I still feel a little part of me. Uh, I was, you know, the weird one or the one bringing in the dissonances because I'm the one who sends them actually. And for the rest, it was okay. But it's like, I couldn't have this thing of saying, oh, well, you know, well, we listen to you and then we can see what we do and it's your reality. And that's okay. That was how you lift it. And that was, yeah, missing this piece uh, mm -hmm, was a very mm -hmm. strong experience. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's what I put under that label of more humane, being more humane with one another, and yeah, and also like what I also hear is like um almost like this judgment that hangs in the air in our professional working environments is like oh you're too sensitive, yeah. And like, you should be able to just drop that and kind of wave it from your shoulders. And But because we dropped so much and didn't pay attention to so many things, that's why we are in the world that we are, yeah? So there is there's value in that sensitivity and I don't think people are oversensitive or highly sensitive. People are just the people they are. Yeah. And they have maybe not buried their sensitivity that others who, let's say, climb the ladder and are successful because they have built an armor around the sensitivity. Um, So yeah, and when you get used to this new culture of how we how we are with each other in the working environment, then it's odd you come across somebody is like, oh, I cannot speak about this here, or there's no space to listen, to be witnessed. Yeah, and I just wanted to name as well from what you said about this. I don't know, like what triggers me from another colleague or from something we usually do. Um, and then you said, oh, why does it trigger me? It's because, you know, maybe in my family, whatever, my childhood or whatever. This I understand what you call the trauma-informed um, collaboration. Yeah, or that's part of it. Part yeah, of it. indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, if, if, yeah, as I said, I'm a therapist. So when I look, let's say, at typical professional working world, um, I would say it's full of trauma responses. I mean, the, the what I call the fighting, like, oh, debate, and yeah, but that's, that's not my point. It can be very civilized, like I'm mentioning the European institutions because that's where I did some of my work. And it can be very civilized. I mean, they're not raising their voices even, and still you feel like Ugh. it's like ah, so much judgment going on or anger going on that's like well behaved. <laughs> a 
but it's still not seeing the other as a full human being yeah with their own capacities and expertise and yeah I lost a bit of dread yeah, yeah, no, don't worry. I was just going to say, I know you have another podcast episode uh, with Lisa Gill on trauma for collaboration. So I will link ah, okay. it to the notes uh, so that people can relate uh, or yeah, make the link uh, between both. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was in yeah. the link. The, um, that's when I, I said I saw a few self-organized teams like totally collapse because people were asking for something and other people thought they needed to give that to the team members and they were each of them was in a trauma response like in a very typical pattern of behaving that came out of their childhood let me put it that way and it totally broke open um collapsed uh people left blah 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 and it was really uh in itself uh very painful um and that's where i noticed that okay if we invite more humane culture we need to become clear on what is still in a professional working context where we can be humane but not do the therapy in the team meetings yeah that kind of thing like where do we draw the line and how can i learn to draw the line and say whoa this is touching me and i see it's touching me way way bigger than what actually happened yesterday between us so i will talk with my partner or my friends or my therapist or whatever so we need to make boundaries between what is a humane cul working culture, but what is still too much to to bring there? Let's not make therapy sessions of every team meeting. That's that's not what why we are together. We are together to do this kind of work. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I had one more question from something you mentioned before. It was this thing of you know speaking to the middle instead of you and I yeah. um, engaging with um, the tension or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's something there as well. I know we talked about in the past and I still find super fascinating. And it's this thing of like tensions happen. Well, maybe the, the triggers, the traumas, the sort of responses, but then also often for societal roles or characteristics that we have, and sometimes it's not, you know, it's like, well, it's kind of like it manifests through me because, for example, I'm a white woman. So there are my, yeah. some things that are, you know, like more accepted in, in the culture that I might do and might offend someone. And of course, it's not OK at a personal personal level either. But there is something about the system that we kind of bring with us uh -huh. and that I have a feeling that doing this in the sharing circle is also a way of okay acknowledging well yes I have things to work on and at the same time there are things that are also bigger than myself or my my capacity and it has to do with the society I mean totally um totally um and I've been recently um working again with people in the, in the European Commission and they're trying an experiment of, of a co-leadership and it's a small team, 10 people. And I had to tell them like, you are, that they are this small team in what's called a directorate, in a DG, in a European context, in the political context, in the global context. And they tried this experiment of more horizontal self-organized unit said can you see how much tension actually comes to you and they tend to take it in an interpersonal way like yeah 
you, you didn't do that. They don't take on this. They don't, I mean, kind of complaints all over the place. And they said, but you have to realize that all this tension comes through all of you. You have to hold it and you have to see it as systemic tensions. It's not you and I. It's because we are in this system where we have these rules and hierarchies and deadlines and da, 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 and we want to work more humane with each other, more peer to peer, more self organized. That will clash many times. And it's not a clash between you and me. And that's a, a, a lens that needs to widen there. What, what can we do in those cases? Can you just acknowledge it? Or is there anything we can do to work with that? Yeah, that's, um, how would I say? That's why I say it's an experiment. Like see it as you are trying to change a culture within a beast of hierarchy, yeah? That sits within a political context of the world, yeah? So how would I say? Don't underestimate what you're doing and don't underestimate um, the powers that be that you're up to, or the or just the traditional ways of doing things. Like, yeah, these directors or whatever they are called, they just say, "I need that by that day, that time." That's it. There's no even a conversation or is that possible or is it not possible shall we okay. yeah yeah this yes this connection between the micro tiny micro and the hyper macro uh we're we're in and we're always affected uh, yes. by it um we're we always affected often and we tend to see it as inter interpersonal between me and the boss or me and my team leader or me of my co-worker who is not doing enough or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we don't see the systemic impact, as you said, like that, what we bring with us. And it's, it's something we need to learn, yeah, to see. Yeah, the few times I manage, I find it very liberating, <laughs> I have to say, that, you know, it's not a weight uh, between two people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted, uh, before ending, I have a couple of questions, and there's something about this, and also it's just a guess, but it's a guess I'm um, working mm -hmm. on at the moment, um, about, let's say, we have self-organizing, and we create a false dichotomy, like all dichotomies, and we would have the very systemic approach to it, that you know, we create a system with clear principles and rules and how we're going to work, da, 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 on the one extreme. And then on the other extreme, we are based on the relationships of how we are together, we, we get to know each other, and um, yeah, we just deepen that um, tissue. And then of course we have some, um, processes, structures that help us mm -hmm. navigate the self-organizing. And I think that because of the experiences of the past, past few months, I realized for me, my, my guess is that greater than is a bit more or definitely much more in the relational than what I would have thought. Um, I don't know, at the beginning, I, maybe, I don't know, for some reason I thought we were a bit more because we do have lots of processes and way of uh, making decisions like a very clear way of doing yeah, yeah. certain things so structures, structures yes very based on the relationships and then for me it was like oh you know we're so based on the relationships that my guess of because of the the or my take on it because of the area of work, of work I am right now it was well if we're so based on the relationships 
you know, we have to work more with emotions because that's the, and maybe not, huh? I'm, I'm asking mm. you, what do you think about that? But what would you mean? What yes. do you mean with work with emotions? Yes, being more, um, so having more granularity, understanding better what is going on with me, why is that happening, trying to understand the other person, and then relating with each other with maybe a, more of, let's say, these principles we've been talking about for the past hour that we make space, that we put it in the middle. They, we have, of course, we have these practices that hold us because if not I think that it's very difficult right like I have a conversation with you and of course we have a deadline I have 30 yeah. minutes blah, blah. so we need those processes to hold us but that um yeah you know there's something there about well if so based in relationships what is between people um is in many ways the the, the emotions that go through me and through you yeah. and through the other people so that there is a need of working more uh, with that or being more mature um with with it so that yeah. it can hold more this let's say option of self-organizing um instead of saying oh you know how we fix certain things like oh we work whether more with emotions or or both maybe you know we go a bit more into the system and maybe you know we need a few things that need to be clearer like, I don't know, but yeah, my take would be, hmm. it's our bet for the reasons, the places we come from based on the relational, let's work more on the emotional layer. I don't know, just wanted to run this by you and see what you think or how you read it or what would be your take on this based on self-organizing, okay, like how, um, you know, taking into account the role that emotions might play. Yeah. I I don't remember if we, we talked about this being and this doing calls um, in in the prep or now, uh, but um, yeah, I would say working with your emotions or working your through, working through the triggers that you have, like really understanding where they're coming from. And um, I would say, uh, or the working towards healing of your emotions, I would not put in the working context. Doesn't mean that healing doesn't happen, but that's not the priority. Yeah. If you notice that over time, your partner, your children, and your work colleagues say something that it's very related, then you better go to a therapist for a few times and figure out what that is. Because there's something that 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 happens everywhere. It's yours. Yeah. Um, but I do think that if we take greater than as an example, because that's what, what we know the best, both both of us. Um, is that although we know trauma-informed, we know about trauma-informed collaboration, the actually seeing it working, the actually understanding that if I'm stressed, I'm in a trauma response, yeah? And you can say, yeah, but I'm stressed because that needs to be done by tomorrow morning or something. It's still a trauma response. You're not centered. You're not grounded. You're not creative. You're not innovative when you're stressed. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a way to go to. I would say. You can leave your emotions at the door, to. Getting a culture where you start to open up more to actually come to a culture where you know yourself so well and you know each other so well like okay okay that was a trauma response sorry 
I can come back to center and be present for innovation and creativity again. Yeah. We have a lot to learn there. Yeah. It's practice. Yeah, lots of learning and, and unlearning, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm curious about your take on, on this. We did we had a call with uh, Tom Nixon and Mickey Cashton a few months ago, and we were asking something. I don't know exactly how the question went, but it was related to this exactly, like how much, or at least, let's say, okay, we're self-organized, but we can't, unfortunately, um, like ask for everyone to work on that or go through therapy or you know do do that work so there are some things that well some people do it and then some others that are held by those processes the system the culture can hold mm -hmm. itself a little bit so that it's a bit of both so that it's not the expectation yeah. that everyone um has to do it because for some for some people it's not possible for a thousand reasons um would you also see it like that that it can be held in that way, a bit from individuals and the culture and processes. I mean, you you can, of course, the, the circle, whatever your circle is, can hold a lot. Um, but in a working context, the priority is still on getting the work done. That's why you are together. Yeah. So the relation, the relational and even the therapy healing work um, is not the priority. <laughs> so, and, and I've said it in trauma-informed collaboration, we're figuring out still, like what is the boundary or where is the boundary? And, and let's say if we can name it uh, as we sometimes do, people who are able to have adult to adult relationship and don't fall every minute, let's say, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but like fall every minute into some kind of trauma response. There needs to be some capacity. If you're 10 and there's one who is still learning or is like apprenticing in that way, that's okay. But if if it's the other way around, like you cannot hold with two, a team of 10 where let's say seven stumble into trauma responses all the time. But again, we are experimenting, we are learning, we're, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I find that really tricky to understand, you know, what is the boundary and I guess for each group is different and um, yeah. It's it, I don't think we have clarity yet on what what the boundary actually is, or we don't have the capacities to make that very explicit. Um, yeah, like any tensions that arise between two people, it's trauma response. That's my take, yeah? That's how I see it. Um, and if, let's say, um, like some something that recently happened is like, if too many people have to spend too many too much time on that conflict on that tension, then something is off. And we cannot hold everybody. Hmm. There, we actually, actually self-organizing actually calls for that capacity to listen, to witness, to share it openly, and to hold intensity. Yeah, and not rush to conclusions or spin out into anger or whatever. It's uh, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> to just stay in learning. The big learning. Yes. Yeah. yeah and um, yeah. then maybe to finalize with something very practical, you've mentioned uh, one already um, common pitfalls 
of uh, circle practice. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one about not respecting the like maybe like one most important principle, which is to listen uh, with the talking piece. What are the other ones that might be typical that you have seen that it's unfortunately easy to fall with, especially in the beginning? Especially in the for? beginning is um, thinking that it's so simple, anyone can do it. That's not true. Um, really make sure you have some practice somewhere else before you bring it to your teammates or ask somebody who is seasoned in it to help your team out in the beginning. Uh, because it is very simple. And in talking piece, speak with intention, listen with attention. There's nothing complicated about it. But the stance from where you can invite people, the, if you are stressed yourself in some way, how will you invite people into drop down and open up? If you are like, mm, is it going to work? <laughs> so that's thinking that it's very simple or simplistic let's call it that way it is simple but there's many unseen layers to it um and make sure that you spend enough time on what is the question actually at hand for this topic for this situation what what, what is it that we spend our time on um and and don't go with the first question that comes in your mind but make sure that you're two or three so that you can say yeah doesn't feel really let's that word doesn't fit like take time to articulate the question really well i think that are the main pitfalls in the beginning and close well don't forget to close close together like naming that take some time for checkout to mm -hmm. it's such a a culture a working culture that people just fizzle out and yeah i don't somehow it doesn't feel right yeah can you do self-organizing without circle practice I haven't thought about that question, but I, how I see self-organizing, I don't think so. Why? Why? Because the the changing culture that you want to do, com coming from hierarchical to peer to peer or adult to adult, there's a learning curve. And I think circle practice is actually a very good practice to learn about that, to learn to put yourself as one of the 12 or the 10 or the 15 instead of I'm under the boss or I am the boss. Yeah, that kind of from both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's that core principle of everybody has a voice in the circle. Um, yeah, so, I never thought about it, but I think that's, yeah, I think that's what I yeah. stand for. <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. But as I hear you speak, it's like, we have this container this format, this circle practice. And there we can feel, because I think that's something that happens to me. It's like, when I'm in circle practice, I feel what self-organizing is. And then what happens in the day-to-day, -day, well, it's a form of aspiration of probably what proper self-organizing would be, but that's uh, really tricky to do. But then you have this sort of like magical container where you get this embodied experience of yeah. how it can be. Exactly. 
and that gives you a compass a little bit i think yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and it can spread to other practices and to even in the operational like where you feel like oh this is flowing very well and yeah don't have to struggle with each other yeah Awesome. Yeah, that's a great uh, realization. Thank you, Ria, uh, <laughs> for that. Thank you, too. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for the conversation and sharing your wisdom with us. And I hope that this has helped some people that might want to, whether get on the path of sort of organizing or deepen uh, the practice. And I think it's always, for me, this has been also a reminder uh, to myself of, wow, you know, and this recent experience we had, wow, sh- like circle practice, how how important, um, how to build it in, make it really a practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah anything you would like yeah. to add, Ria, before finalizing? Not specifically. I, we just need to see that. Once again, we're experimenting and it's put it in a long time frame. We are not going to cut it in one generation probably like i mean how long does the is that hierarchical system in place hundreds of years we're not going to overnight get it out of our bodies and out of our minds we're so it's so ingrained yeah that that there's somebody who has to say it or somebody who has to tell me or uh, or from the other side, like we were always the boss, so I can just say da 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 da. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. Put yourself in 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 the the bigger time frame of how this whole awareness mainstream culture is trying to shift. But I mean, it's a big boat. We're trying to. <laughs> yeah it's trying to steer the other way yeah yeah one one circle practice at a time then. exactly <laughs> thank you so much ria once again thank you see you in yeah yeah our zoom calls very soon yeah. take care thank bye you. bye ta, ta. thank you i hope this conversation with uh, my colleague ria was very helpful for you or as helpful as it was for me I had a couple of realizations and then I always find it's very helpful to review the basics of the self-organizing formats that we might have used for a long time and take for granted so come back to the basics understand uh, what is actually needed and then for me it was really very yeah, powerful to understand uh, these two things um, about the, the witnessing. So what does the witnessing do to you when you're in a circle and you're able to have um, that experience that at the end of the day is telling you that you're okay, that you're accepted, uh, you're okay as you are. And I find that extremely powerful. And then the other one of circle practice being such a crucial part of self-organizing and allowing for this embodied experience of knowing, ah, this is how it flows when we have the right container. And for the moments in which it doesn't work because well, we're all stressed or it's difficult or whatever happens in the day-to-day with the many constraints that we have to still know, okay, I can come back to that or how do I feel when I'm in circle practice, how can I bring a, a little bit of that uh, right now as a as a reminder, or even sometimes as a place of hope when you're like, ah, this is not working. But then you go into circle practice, like, ah, this is it. You feel the connection with the others. And, um, and yet you have this very simple set of rules, but as Ria was saying, there's a lot um, below them. So, that it allows for that that to work. And I think that, um, yeah, self-organizing has a lot to do with that. And then I really enjoyed as well talking about jamming a little bit this like personal and or relationships and uh, systemic dichotomy 
I'm trying to understand uh, better. And then she brought in this very interesting, this dimension about the boundaries between what is work and you know where is it that uh, we need to do the healing outside of work. And what is actually bringing us together is moving some something forward. So also knowing that not having a clear answer about where that boundary is, is okay. And uh, that maybe doesn't exist yet. So yeah, that allows me to relax a little bit into the question. Still uh, feeling, feeling a bit unsettled sometimes when something happens, you're like, okay, what is this? It's therapy, it's work, is it okay, is it not? Um, but yeah, that's what, as Ria said and stressed many times, I think it's really important that we have a look at um, our self-organizing practice and efforts with compassion because we're just experimenting and learning and trying to turn um, a very big boat. So yeah, I hope this was helpful for you too. See you in the next episode.